Come on, let's clap our hands for our young people. We're not going to stop praising the Lord. Let the church say amen. amen. We didn't say we didn't have some trials and some tribulations. We didn't say there wouldn't be any sickness, any disease, or any death. But what we said was, What had happened, we're not going to stop praising his name. Let me tell you what a praise will do. It'll carry you through. I've been grieving at points in my life, but I wasn't grieving at those who had no hope. So while I was crying, I was saying, Lord, I praise you. I'm going to leave that alone. But praise is not in the keyboard. And it's not on the drums. But I heard Jesus say, out of your belly. It's a spirit of praise. And if you don't have a spirit of praise, you got to see Jesus. All right. I'm not going to stop praising his name. I have the privilege. We got a preacher. That's what they said. We're going to bring him. One of our own, Reverend Herman Armstrong. He likes to be called Saint Armstrong. Letting us know that he's sanctified, set apart for the purposes of God. And we want to connect with him as he delivers the word of God. But we're going to have to do it by faith. We're going to have to put our faith in the word of God. And then we'll bear fruit of the same. Raise your right hand with me. Say, Saint Armstrong. Preach the word. Saint Armstrong. Preach the word. <laughs> I had said many times that sometime I was going to get up in the 11 o'clock service and say I'm going to introduce myself. And I am Saint. Herman Armstrong. <laughs> we as Baptists, sometimes we are reluctant to use the word saint. But if you have been born into the family of God, it doesn't make it any different what denomination you are. You're not some super-dude Christian. You're just a vessel that's been set apart to be used by the Lord. So therefore, we are all saints. <laughs> I am indeed grateful to God for this opportunity to stand here and to share with you a portion of God's word. 
I'm grateful to the pastor for calling me and asking me to bring the message today in his place. We want to be in much prayer for the pastor. I talked to him for the, the last two days, and he informed me about how bad he wants to be here. And as a pastor, and me being an ex-pastor, I can understand. But there's come a time, my friends, when this Reverend, the late uh, Pastor Barry used to say that when you are young, you tell your body what you're going to do. But there'll come a time when your body tells you. And you have to listen to your body. So I informed him that it is natural for a pastor to want to be uh, in the church preaching the gospel to, the, to his parishioners. But sometimes, the body does not heal like they do when, they, when you're young. So you have to take a little time and listen to the doctors. We always are grateful to God for giving men and women more knowledge about the affray of bodies of ours. Healing had to come from God. And sometimes God doesn't heal overnight. It takes time. So be in much prayer for him and his family. Um, God is good. I want to um, say thank you to our young adults this morning. All of the songs that they were singing was biblically based. One of the greatest things that Satan have going for him today is some of our hymnology. Some of our hymns are not biblically based. They are geared for emotion. But when you can sing songs and you can go to the scripture and put scripture with those songs, that is a wonderful experience. As I listen to the young adults in their uh, devotion, uh, Lord, you are worthy. And truly we know that the Lord is worthy for all praises. Then they sing a song saying, Hallelujah. And Hallelujah simply means just praise the Lord. And there are many scriptures, particularly in the psalm, tell us that uh, there are some psalms that are called Hallelujah Psalm, praising the Lord. Then the next song they sing was, O oh Lord, uh, we praise you, your name, for your goodness. For truly the Lord is good and he's worthy to be praised. And then they sing a song that he is not here uh, in the grave. My friend, we find that the word of God said that if he was in the grave, then God would not be satisfied with what he had done on the cross. Because Romans 4.25 says he died for our offenses and God raised him from the dead for our justification. If he was in the grave, you and me would not be justified. See, but he, because God was satisfied with what he had done, then God raised him from the dead so we could be fully acquitted, guilty, but acquitted. He is not here. Someone put it this way. When it, he died, his death put a swinging doors on the grave. They swung for him to go in and they swung for him to come out. And then the last song they sing, if you confess the Lord, then call him up. Romans the fifth chapter says that when he rose from the dead, he gave us direct access to his throne. Now we can go to God for ourselves. First Peter 2 9 says we are a royal priesthood. And the priests have not only responsibility in the Old Testament to go to God, okay, for uh, in worship service from God to man, the prophet came from man to God. But now since we are a royal priesthood, we kin to the king. And now we can go to God for ourselves. And not only for ourselves, we can go for one another. The Bible tells us we ought to have intercessory prayers, praying for one another. Biblically based song, how wonderful.
Our message today is coming from the prophet Daniel. Daniel, the ninth chapter, verses 20 through 24. Daniel, the ninth chapter, 20 through 24. We would like for you to, those of you who like to keep figures and mathematics, we would like for you to keep your Bible open, and we're going to be throwing out some figures, and we want you to uh, uh, pay close attention to Bible prophecies. Someone might ask the question, uh, what is Bible prophecy? We're going to see that Bible prophecies is pre-written history. And only God can pre-write history. We're going to see that God has said in his word that I know the end before the beginning and I have the power to do whatever I counsel. Psalm, uh, Isaiah 46, 10. In the book of Daniel, the ninth chapter, verses 20 through 27. How many of you have ever heard of the 70 weeks of Daniel? How many of you have uh, heard that we are living in this church age between the 69th and the 70th week of Daniel? Well, if you have not, then we're going to see what the Word of God have to say about that. How many of you have heard that the Word of God all the time is not written in a chronological order? So therefore, sometimes uh, uh, there's a gap principle in Bible study. But here in the ninth chapter of Daniel, there are going to be some gaps to be filled, filled in. And if you do not understand the book of Daniel, uh, these few verses, there's no way you can understand the book of Revelation. There's no way you can understand Matthew 24 and 25. There's no way you can understand uh, 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter. It all depends on Bible prophecy. In the next chapter of Daniel, verses 20 through 27, you will find these words. Now keep in mind that these words were spoken uh, by the uh, 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 angel Gabriel, whom uh, God had dispatched to Daniel to answer a prayer that Daniel was praying. Daniel here, after the Babylonian captivity, and many of the Jews had gone back to Jerusalem. Many had stayed in uh, the Persian Empire. Some had left and went to Alexandria, Egypt. And here Daniel was a little confused about, as he had read the prophecy of Jeremiah, the 20th chapter and the 29th chapter, that they were going to be in captivity for 70 years, and now the 70 years was over. And Daniel was concerned about what was going to happen to his people, the Jews, in Jerusalem. And now he had prayed to God, and now God had dispatched the angel Gabriel to answer him his question. Therefore, in the 20th verse, it says, And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sins and the sins of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for his holy mountain uh, uh, for the holy mountain of my God. Yet while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in a vision uh, beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening obligation, oblation, which was three o'clock in the afternoon. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I am now come uh, forth to give thee skill of wisdom and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplication, uh, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Notice the vision. Seven weeks are determined upon thy people. 
and upon the holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end to sin and to make reconciliation in it for iniquity and bring in the everlasting righteousness and seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the, holy, the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore, to rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. And the street shall be built and the, again and the wall even in troubled time. And after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with the flood. And upon that end of war and desolation are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall call the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of the abomination okay, shall he make it desolate even until the consummation and the de uh, that determined shall be poured out on the desolate. So read the word of God. From those verses, we're going to use for a thought, we serve the omni God. We serve a omni God. Omni means all. Many times we hear the expression, he is omnipotent, he is omniscient, and he is omnipresent. From the words of this text, we're going to be uh, most concerned with two of his omnis. And that means he's the omni. Uh, uh, omnipotent, all-powerful, and he is omniscient. He knows everything. If someone asks you to prove to them that God is real, prove to them they are sincere, how would you answer them? You can say, look at the trees, and they'll say, uh, uh, that doesn't prove to them that there is a God. When in the book of Luke, the 44th chapter, the 24th chapter and the 44th verse, on the Lord resurrected day, you know the story, his apostle was in the upper room a friend of the Jews, doors locked, runners secured, and all of a sudden there stood Jesus, and they thought he was a ghost. And he had them to understand everything that was written about me and the laws of Moses and the Psalms and the prophets had to be fulfilled. For it behooved behoove, uh, Christ, he called himself Christ, to suffer and to enter into his glory the third day. Everything that was written about him in the laws of Moses and in the Psalms and the prophets, pre-written history, there was enough evidence, enough prophecy that had been prophesied in the Old Testament that he had fulfilled on his resurrection that he was the Son of God. Old Testament prophecy. The Lord says to Isaiah in the 46th chapter, there's no one like me. I know the ending before the beginning, and I have the power to do whatever I counsel. Whatever I tell my prophets to write, I have the power to bring it to pass. As we study God's word and look at this prophecy, particular uh, verses uh, 24 through 27, 
to understand just those four verses. These are four verses is uh, a key to understanding the word of God from the book of Nehemiah, the second chapter, first and second chapter, all the way through through the tribulation period in the kingdom age. Gap principle. You might say, well, then what do you mean by gap principle? Many times when prophecies are written, they uh, skip over in the Old Testament, they skip over the church age entirely. The church age is not there. Case in point. Isaiah 9, uh, 6. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And then the government shall be upon his shoulder. There are three gaps there. Over 2,000 years ago, a child was born in the city of Bethlehem. 33 years later, a son was given on the cross when he died. Many things happened from the time he was born up until the time that he went to the cross, but it skips over that. But as you study God's word, you must be able to fill in gaps. The government shall be up on his shoulders. That hasn't happened as yet. That is talking about the kingdom age. But it will come to pass. Now you got to fill in what has happened uh, between the time that he uh, uh, died, okay, and what happened but up until the kingdom age. You got to learn to fill in that gap. Another case in printing the Old Testament, there are many. In the book of Zechariah, Zechariah prophesies in 9 9 about the Lord Jesus Christ coming in Jerusalem, riding on a coat in the fold of an ass what we call Palm Sunday. But when you read Zechariah 9, 10, and 11, it skips all over uh, his, his, the, the church age, the tribulation period, and 9, 10 deal with the kingdom age. You have to fill in the gaps. Then when you get to the New Testament, there are many uh, uh, scriptures that you got to fill in the gaps. The Lord talked about one in the fifth chapter of John, verses uh, 28 and 29. The Lord says the, uh, the time is coming when all in the grave is going to hear his voice and come forth. Those that have done good to the resurrection of life and those that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. But the Lord didn't say it was going to happen at the same time. As you study the word of God in the book of Revelation, you find that there's a thousand years between the resurrection of the good, the final resurrection, in coming stages, and then the resurrection of the unsaved. It's a thousand years in between, so you got to learn how to deal with the tribulation period and the kingdom age before the resurrection of the unsaved. Here in our text, there are several uh, gaps, but this those four, four, four verses give us the history of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we have to learn how to fill in the gaps on this prophecy. He was praying. Many of the Jews had went back to Jerusalem. Some had stayed in Persia. And we find that Many of the Jews had settled down there because they had key jobs. The Persian Empire were very sympathetic to the Jews. Daniel had been elevated to a key position in the Persian Empire. But he was curious about, as he read the book of Jeremiah, what is going to happen to my people and what is going to happen to Jerusalem? The angel Gabriel dispatched by God the Father. Sin and he fly, flew swiftly, and he touched the lips of Daniel about three o'clock in the afternoon. And notice what he informed Daniel. At the beginning of thy supplication, the 23rd verse, when you begin to pray unto God, 
and ask God concerning a pacific, is a supplication mean, being pacific in your prayers. He said the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved by God the Father. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the, consider the vision. Notice the vision. Now these weeks, they are not seven day weeks. They are, each week represent seven years. Seventy, seven, seventy weeks are determined upon thy people to, uh, uh, and the holy city to finish the transgression and make an end to sin and to make reconciliation for the iniquity and to bring an everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Seventy weeks is determined upon thy people. Seventy times seven is 490 years. He said that God is going to be working with the Jews, your people, for 490 years. And then he's going to bring an everlasting righteousness and he's going to bring, uh, uh, do away with sin among your people. But he got to work with them for 490 years. But then notice how he divided that 490 years in verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem until the Messiah, which is Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. And the streets shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous time. Notice seven weeks. Seven times seven is 49. It took the Jews 49 years to build the walls and the infrastructure of Jerusalem. Then he says, and 60 and two weeks before the Messiah, the Prince, shall come. 62 weeks, seven times 62 is 434 years. When you add 434 years on to uh, 49 years, you come up with a figure of 483 years. 69 weeks times seven is 483 years that he can be working with Jerusalem, the Jews. Then he says, and the people of the prince that shall come. See, there's a gap there. They're going to destroy Jerusalem. Now he's talking about the Antichrist. The Romans destroyed the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD. But notice he skipped over. Okay. He said in uh, uh, 483 years, there are going to be uh, the Messiah, the Prince, that shall come. And when a decree will be issued for, uh, to go back and rebuild the city and, the, and the, the infrastructure until the Messiah come, it's going to be 483 years. But he said he's going to be working with the Jews uh, 490 years. In the book of Nehemiah, we want you to go and read Nehemiah verses, the first chapter and the first eight verses of the second chapter. And when you read that Nehemiah was praying about the same prayer that Daniel was praying uh, uh, in the book of Daniel. Nehemiah, 
had been elevated. He was one of those men that decided, Jews, that decided not to go back to Jerusalem. And he had been elevated to what is called the king cupbearer of Artaxerxes, and the cupbearer had the responsibility to taste all the food and drink that went to the king and be, to make sure that it was not poison. Here was a Jew working for a Gentile. I never forget, a few years ago I had the opportunity to go to Los Angeles, California, and I spent the day with Dr. E.V. Hill. Some of you might know him. When I went into Dr. Hill's office that Sunday morning, and he had not uh, gotten to the office yet, but the deacon told me that he'd be in a minute, he just called, he's on his way. He said, well, just sit here. He'd be glad to see you. So finally, Dr. Hill got there, and I didn't think he was going to recognize me, but he did. And we sat there, and we was talking, and there was a, a food, a platter, uh, uh, some fruit that a lady had brought in for him. And he asked the deacon, where did this come from? And the deacon said, I can't think of the lady's name, but I've seen her talking to you seven time, several times. He said, well, go find her and bring her here. So the deacon left, he came back, he said, I can't find her. He said, go look again and bring her until I want to see her. The deacon left and then Dr. Hill said to me, he said, that look good, don't it? I said, it really does. That California fruit just off of the fruit tree there in California, it was, it was looking good. He said, but if he don't find her, I said, it's going in the trash can. <laughs> he said, I don't need any food. A drinking of water that I don't know where it came from. So finally, he came back with the, with the lady, and he said, oh, yes, yeah, Miss so-and-so. And she said, yeah. He said, I should sure thank you for the food. So she left, and he said, now I'm going to eat. He said, the reason why I don't eat anything that someone gave to me, and if I don't know who it came from, see, someone brought a plate of food to me one day. He said, I wasn't here, but it sure looked good. And I decided I was going to eat it and say, the Spirit of God said, don't eat that food. And say, uh, I, 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 I delayed and eat it, and, and so finally I'm going to feel, say, the Spirit of God said, don't eat that food. Say, and he was fully convinced that the Spirit of God was speaking. And after he left the office, he carried that food by a, a, a chemist, and they analyzed that food and said, Doctor, I'm so glad you didn't eat it. See, there's enough arsenic in this food that two spoonfuls will have killed you. He said, you'd be surprised at the people right here in this church. They're so envy and jealous, they'll kill me. And that same day, he's all the work that I do in this city. There are people in this church and outside of the church want me dead. The same day, he was opening up a, a uh, home for unwed mothers that Sunday evening. 15 beds for mothers getting out of the hospital and didn't have any with their babies and didn't have anywhere to go. He was doing a mighty work. Here in the book of, and whenever I think about Nehemiah, I think about Dr. Hill. And here, uh, uh, Nehemiah, friends came down from Jerusalem. And he asked them the question about how was things in Jerusalem. And they gave him a sad story. The walls are destroyed. The gates are burned. You, uh, uh, the graves yards are not being taken care of. The enemies is in and out of the city. And the Bible said that he told uh, 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 Nehemiah this in the month of Shislu, which was the ninth month of the Jewish calendar. And he said that uh, Nehemiah said that uh, uh, I held my composure, as we paraphrase this, for f approximately four months. He was going in before the king every day, twice a day, to carry him his food and his drinks. And he said, I'd never been sad before the king. But when he would leave the king and from feeding him, then he'd go back to his chambers, he said, for about four months until the month of Nehemiah. I mean, the month of uh, 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 Nisan, four months different. 
And then he went before the king, he says, sad. Now there he was, the king cupbearer, tasting the food to make sure it wasn't poison. And you can imagine how he felt, how the king would feel. Here he come in sad. And the king asked him, why are you sad? You're not sick. But he had been praying and waiting on the Lord for four months and concealing his feeling before the king. Now notice uh, Gabriel had told Daniel that when a decree would be issued for someone to buy the king or someone to go back and rebuild the walls, it's going to be uh, uh, 483 years before the Messiah come. And he told the king about his problem. And the king issued a decree in the month of Nisan in 445 B.C. He went back, and the walls began to be filled, be, be, and the infrastructure. Took them 49 years, as we said previously. And you, and you add the other uh, 62, that's 483 years. And the scripture says, and the Messiah, the prince, is going to ride and come into Jerusalem, but not for himself. He's going to uh, 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 be killed, but not for himself. From Nehemiah 2, to the time when the Lord Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem on a coat and a fold of an ass, to fulfill Zechariah 9.9, it was exactly 483 years. Then he says, but he's not going to die, he not for himself. When he died on that cross, exactly 483 years from Nehemiah 2, he didn't die for himself, but he died for your sin and my sin. Then we find, he says, and the people of the prince are going to destroy Jerusalem. He's talking about the Romans now. In 70 AD, the Romans, under the Emperor Titus, he was a general then, before he came the emperor, he led the Roman soldiers through Jerusalem. Notice he said, and the people of the prince is going to destroy Jerusalem. The Romans destroyed Jerusalem, and they said the people of the prince that shall come, he is talking about the Antichrist who is going to be a Roman. 13th chapter of Revelation. Titus, the Roman soldiers, they destroyed Jerusalem, tore down the walls, tore down the temple, plowed the ground, ran the Jews out of Jerusalem. They lost their statehood, and they didn't become a nation again until 1948. But when they became a nation, they still did not own the Temple Mount. The Muslim had a dome of the rock. There was a gap. To understand what happened, it says, uh, and the people of the prince that shall come, and then he talked about uh, uh, the tribulation period. You see, at the rapture of the church, which is skipped over in this prophecy, the rapture of the church got to happen before the prince, the, uh, the Antichrist, take his position. Let's say that at the rapture of the church happened today. And all the saints throughout this world is raptured up. This world is going to be in a chaotic situation. But there are going to be a con artist. He's going to be a Roman. And he's going to promise the Jews that how he was going to allow them to build their temple. He's going to allow them to start sacrificing. He's going to allow them to worship like they did under King David. But notice what the scripture says. In the middle of the week, you see, he would have, God would have been dealing with the nation Israel now for 483 years. 
But he talked about what was going to happen in 490 years. So God got one more week, seven more years to deal with the nation Israel, which is the tribulation period. And we find that he said in the middle of that week, after three and one half years, the Antichrist is going to go into the temple and he's going to put his image there and demand it to be worshipped as God. He's going to uh, uh, changed his mind against the Jews. And at the 13, 12 and 13 chapter of Revelation, he's going to make a concerted effort to kill every Jew in sight. For he says that uh, he, uh, uh, Satan have not forgiven the woman for bringing forth the man child. The woman is the nation of Israel, and the man child is Jesus Christ. Satan had never forgiven her for bringing forth the man child. So he's gonna make a concerted effort in the last three and one half years to do his thing. The book of Revelation says it's gonna be 42 months. The divide of time, time is one, uh, 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 time two is two years, and the divide of time is a half a year, three and one half years. This is the reason why, if you're going to some, to some seminary school, and you taking a, 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 want to get a diploma or degree in theology. Some seminary school will not allow you to study the book of Revelation until you have studied Daniel, and the, in particular these four verses. You cannot understand the book of Revelation. You cannot understand the, 12th, the 24th and 25th chapter of Matthew. You cannot understand.